I am Harris Leonard Kligman, the only son of immigrant parents. And uh, my background is somewhat unique in that um, I've served with the United States Army for a little over 21 years. I was commissioned in 1958 as a second lieutenant in infantry. I shortly thereafter, because of uh, my linguistic abilities and the fact that I was traveling in my civilian job, uh, approximately 60% plus of my uh, year to uh, the continents of uh, South America, Africa, and the Far East, I put in for a branch transfer to intelligence, and that became my primary military occupation, especially for the uh, approximately 18, 19 years that I continued to serve as a United States Reserve officer. It's important to mention at this, this stage that I was not on active duty all during that time. I served uh, approximately two years uh, initially in arc of duty. Then I uh, came back and I was part of the 28th Infantry Division for about four years of the Pennsylvania National Guard. And uh, then shortly thereafter, I was transferred by my company to Seoul, Korea, where I lived for approximately four and a half years and traveled the entire Far East area as their uh, Far East manager. I found that uh, in many of the countries that I traveled as a civilian in uh, pursuit of the business that uh, I was in, the fact that I was a military officer opened a uh, number of doors for me. In many of these countries, they were ruled by a military dictatorship or the military was a strong uh, secondary government to the one that appeared to be for the country uh, that I, I went to. Um, through the identification as a military officer, it enabled me to bond with many of the people that made the decisions in various departments, such as the Indonesian Department of Trade, which was became a close friend of mine, a three-star general by the name of Mosquita. Um, we were able to do significant amount of business. Uh, when the United States Army needed me, they brought me back to active duty, certainly for training and in several schools, one of which I graduated was the United States Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, and I had a very interesting career because of a uh, primary MOS, military occupation specialty as a, an intelligence officer, each of these countries that I would visit made it a point to uh, meet with and check in with the military attaché's office. I got to know many of them. Uh, in Korea, for example, where I lived for four and a half years, military attaché's office asked me to do a few things for him. Since I had a legitimate legend, as we call it in tradecraft, my job, my appearance was one of uh, a uh, an officer of a company that dealt in the sale of commodities such as gold, oil, rice, uh, copper. It was legitimate. I didn't have to make up a fictitious one. Uh, and I was able to do um, many of the things this attaché's office asked me to do because of the individuals, for instance, the various departments of the Korean government, uh, Korean uh, military that I uh, could work with and did work with. And uh, it gave me a sense of pride because as I mentioned at the outset, my parents are immigrants. They've always felt that this was the greatest country in the world. They owed something to this country for the freedom they enjoyed. They always uh, encouraged me to reciprocate in the best way that I could. My dad suggested that when I attended the university that I serve in the army, he once asked me a question. He says, Harris, do you want to lead or do you want to follow? Wasn't sure quite what he meant. And then he said, do you want to lead 
or do you want to follow? You must go into the military. There's a draft. Do you want to lead or follow? I said, Dad, I'd like to lead. He said, in that case, there's a program at the university called Reserve Officers Training Course, ROTC. You'll be commissioned if you're selected to attend the advanced course as a uh, army officer, and uh, you'll serve your country as a leader. Uh, I thought it was the most profound advice that I could have received as a young guy with the addition that my dad always stressed, remain calm. If you're calm, you can face any situation. You can take a, the, the problem and divide it into parts, solve the part, then you'll solve the problem. But if you do not remain calm, you will not succeed in whatever you're trying to do. Good words. I remember in the service that I had to do that too. Uh, remain calm. Uh, the men you lead, the men you work with, look to you as a leader. Uh, I still remember the military definition of um, leadership. Uh, as the Army has it, the art of influencing a man in such a way as to obtain his respect, obedience, and loyal cooperation in order to accomplish a mission. I never, ever forgot that. And everything I tried to do and succeeded in most cases was initially to remain calm, face the problem, do what my, my intuition and my uh, training and my experience dictated, and get that problem solved. Um, I have uh, mentioned that I have met a uh, number of people through my uh, association in the military and because of my civilian life. Many of these people were good guys uh, and good women. Some were not so good and some in between. Some were really bad. I uh, once told my son, Rob, that uh, I collected people as a circus collects animals, never thinking that I would become a writer, never gave it much thought with the exception of one thing. Because I was away so much, uh, I felt a void between myself and my children. When I used to travel, either going or coming back, returning from a particular country or several, I would spend time on the airplane bored out of my mind. I uh, then decided that I would start writing a children's story, which I could then read with them when I came home. Hopefully, through that story, we would bond, laugh, uh, enjoy each other. And uh, I wrote a number of children's stories. The latest, by the way, and I do have it, uh, is entitled The Word Man. I was... Um, in this instance, I happened to be sitting in a hotel, um, the Drake Hotel in New York, and I thought I was listening in the Drake, Drake Hotel sitting in the lobby. I was waiting for my appointment, and I was listening to a number of people speak a myriad of languages, French, English, Spanish, whatever. Uh, and I thought to myself, wow, what a world this would be if we had no way of communicating with each other. There were no words. So when I got home to Connecticut, I decided I'd write a story called The Word Man, who would capture all these words, would not let the world speak, and uh, would absolutely bring the world to silence. Then one day, while he was laughing on a sand dune, a young girl walked by and saw the words, all words that she couldn't speak, dancing above his head as the word man was moving left and right and dancing all around the sand dune. And he looked at the little girl and she would not move and she couldn't say anything, obviously. And the word man says, ah, I think we'll have a challenge. If you can uh, solve a riddle, I will let the words be free again. But if you can, then you belong to me. And then the question is, and I won't spoil it for anybody that might want to <laughs> read this uh, children's book, um, did the little girl solve the, the riddle? And that kind of thing. I would read um, with my uh, sons about this. We would laugh. Nancy, my wife, um, would also join and, and partake in it. And we had a lot of fun and we all bound bound it pretty well together. And speaking of Nancy, which is a very, very interesting story. 
Uh, as I mentioned, I lived in Korea for approximately four and a half years. Um, I absolutely immersed myself in their culture. It was shortly after the war. Uh, war ended in Korea in 1953. I got there in the early 60s. Pretty rough place. It had a military curfew from 12 midnight to 4 as an intelligence officer working with the embassy there. I had military intelligence plates, so I was not inhibited in any way. Anyway, four and a half years later, I came back uh, as an only child and immigrant parents. My mom and dad expected me to move back into the house. I did, uh, and we bonded back together again. And then one day, my dad says, do you have a moment, Harris? I'd like to talk to you for a second. Of course, and I have time for you anytime. He said, um, I have a friend who's about your age. and." Um, He's given me a list of young ladies and their telephone numbers, and perhaps you'd like to call them. Uh, strange. I mean, I've been in the military. I'm an officer. By this time, I was uh, had the rank of captain. Um, I had been to more countries than people could even imagine. When somebody once asked me, where have you been, Harris? I said, it's easier to tell you where I haven't been than where I have been. Anyway, that ends me this paper. And there's about three or four or five uh, ladies' names on it, and I, I have to call them. My dad said, "I want you to do this." That's it's like a commanding officer giving an order. So I called up the first one, and I took the young lady out. We had a nice dinner, rather expensive, and chemistry wasn't there. I learned from that. Uh, I don't have to do fancy dinners anymore. I called up the second one. And I said, would you uh, like to go out? She said, yeah. So we arranged a time where we just had a drink. That didn't work out either. Uh, and I took the paper and I kind of like threw it away. My dad didn't inquire any, any further. And then at my office, I got a telephone call. I received one. And it happened to be the individual that uh, gave my dad the list of numbers. And he said to me, Harris, are you, uh, this is Phil. Uh, we haven't met, but... Uh, did your dad give you a list of numbers of some young ladies? I said, sure, Phil, I did. Did you call him? Oh, of course, sure. I think I called them all. He says, well, you might have missed one, and I'm having lunch, and he named a very elegant place, and it's on me. Would you like you to come, and we'll have lunch together? And I figured, why not? <laughs> not, not gonna, that's not going to cost me. Uh, Nancy was there, and I thought she was at first uh, beautiful. That's what men initially look at. Very attractive uh, lady, well attired, uh, impeccable manners. Her speech pattern was wonderful. She was jovial. She could laugh. Uh, she was interesting. And at the end of this, I thought, wow, this is uh, quite the young lady. Uh, and I leaned over and I said, would you kindly let me have your telephone number? Eh, kind of 50-50, I thought. And she looked at me, she said, sure. She opened her purse, took out a small piece of paper, passed the telephone number to me. The next day I called her, she invited me down. We went swimming. A couple of three, four days later, we still saw each other and talked on the phone and went out and ate. On the sixth day, Nancy and I were walking along uh, downtown Philadelphia. And I stopped and I looked at her and I said, Nancy, I really, truly love you. It's called love at first sight. Everybody makes fun when you use that terminology. But in my case, I truly believe that this is the way I feel about you. And I'd like you to marry me. Will you marry me? And she looked back at me, uh, didn't take a deep breath, didn't close her eyes, didn't shake her head in any way, simply said, yes. So <laughs> when she went home, she told her mom that that uh, fellow that I introduced you to a few days ago, mom, uh, asked me to marry him. And I said, yes, her mother got shingles from head to toe. And she said, well, uh, it's going to take me at least six months before we can get married, figuring that this one beautiful young daughter that I have will finally realize the insanity of what she just did and say goodbye to this guy, some lunatic from Korea, some military guy that was here, there, and every other where. 
lo and behold, six months later, the wedding, the wedding took place. And uh, this October will be 55 years we are married. I, I want to say just one thing in, uh, in addition to that. During my travels, I have met a number of women. And uh, I have met uh, mostly strong, determined women, intelligent, uh, dedicated, they're problem solvers, they're uh, soft when they need to be, they're very hard, shell-like when that needs to be done. And uh, I thought many, many years ago that if and when I ever had the choice to have a partner, and I did have a few along the way, it would always be with a woman. I felt my back would always be covered. I knew that once we agreed on whatever it was we were doing, I didn't have to repeat it five times as you do to a man. And I learned uh, often that uh, if you listened, as I did to my wife many, many times, uh, you learn things from it. A man has this facade that they think they're strong because they have muscles and they this and that, and they play this sport and that sport but they don't necessarily have the softness that a woman has. And uh, I found that uh, with my wife, um, I have learned a great deal. We have grown together. And the other thing that uh, I have to credit my wife with is that uh, because I was away so often, as I say, 60% plus of my time, she had all the responsibilities of not only being a mother and doing motherly things with the boys, she had to take the role of a father too. And the more I understood how difficult in some instances it was when the pipes would break or the scar needs service or whatever it would be, my respect and admiration for her grew. And I often thought that a lesser woman faced with the same challenges that I presented her, would have said, look, I've had enough of this. This is insanity. You're not around. You're missing anniversaries, birthdays, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I just went out of here. Nancy always felt that marriage was a commitment and it took two to make it work. And if there was difficulty with one, but the love still existed, the other one would compensate for it. And I have never, never forgot it. And I, all my life, and this is how I base our relationship, is I'm eternally grateful for all the she did with those absences, all she endured, never, ever complained. I recall one instance uh, where I came home from New York, I was traveling, and she says to me, she says, Harris, Harris, you have that far away look in your eye. Where are you going now? And I said, Nancy, I've got to go to Bangladesh, Dhaka, Bangladesh for a wedding. She says, what are you going to Bangladesh for a wedding for? I open my attaches case. I take out a bag of gold coins, about 30. We, at that time, the company I worked for owned a company in New Jersey, manufactured gold. I was going to this wedding. It was our wedding present, the company's wedding present to the individual who was uh, powerful in this particular country in Bangladesh. We needed him. Uh, and who better than Klinkman? So I said, it will only be a three or four day trip. I don't know how long, but not much more than that. And Nancy, being the trooper that she was, said, OK, you know, be safe, et cetera, et cetera. I went over there. Um, Flew all night, went there, uh, met my uh, counterpart over there. He took me to the wedding. I'd never been to a wedding uh, in Bangladesh before. I walk in, I see this woman on a wooden platform. Her fingers, her ears, her toes were all full of gold bracelets and rings, nose rings, bracelets, uh, necklaces. I never saw so much gold in my life. He said, uh, Harris, we'll wait a few minutes. Uh, we will both walk up to the platform. You kind of like bow, okay, and open up your bag, take out a couple of coins, and just leave the bag of gold there. We did. Sat back down, and I turned to him quietly after a few minutes. I said, when's the reception? He says, oh, it's probably another half hour, but you're going back to the airport. 
I said, okay, I go back to the airport. It was good news for me. I hadn't shaved, hadn't showered. In those days, I always carried a bottle of cologne in my pocket. I could spray behind the ears, along the neck, wherever. So if I didn't look good, at least I smelled good. <laughs> well, anyway, I go back to the airport and I get on my plane. I had to wait about five or six hours. You can imagine what you can do in the airport in Bangla, Dhaka, Bangladesh, do zero. Got on and we took the plane that stopped in transit at Frankfurt, Germany. It was 1970s. They were hijacking planes left and right. I looked disheveled. I had a, a growth of beard, uh, but I did smell good. And I'm walking towards the transit lounge. Next thing I know, somebody's talking in German to me about come over here. I speak German. I'm okay with it. Uh, I answered him an American. He didn't want to by that. He said, let me see your passport. I took it out. Next thing I know, he took me to a room. We, I undressed. He searched me, um, found nothing, of course. Um, got dressed, walked out. We all shook hands and smiled like I'm figuring, yeah, sure. And I walked to the transit lounge and I, I get on a plane and I come back to Nancy. I hadn't been to sleep except what I could on the plane. Hadn't showered. Loved that spring <laughs> alone. Uh, finally walked in and uh, kind of hugged and everything and said, how did it go? And I said, where do you want me to begin? And, you know, from the uh, non-reception, the woman with all the, the filigree and painting all over her arms and everything. And go, anyway, those are the kind of things that, that I experienced. Um, we did a business with a lot of interesting people. Um, some are, were pretty good and we um, we acclimated well. We uh, had a camaraderie, which was pretty uh, interesting. I remember it was either in Sierra Leone or Suriname. Don't remember exactly. We were working with a Lebanese gentleman and um, he picked me up at his hotel, got on my hotel. And I thought we were going back to his office to discuss whatever it was. And we get to a large walled building where the car stops. I knew immediately it was a prison. And along the wall of the prison were a number of women, small children, boys, girls, baskets full of fruit, meat, and all kinds of edibles. And the next thing I know, I'm walking towards this metal door, which opens. There's a be-metaled man, whatever his rank was, the commander or whatever he was of the prison, several armed guards. And the next thing I know, I'm taking a tour of this prison, 15 or so minutes, we walk back out, we shake hands, smile, I get back in the car, we start going uh, away from the prison. And uh, I asked him, I said, what was that all about? And he said, that Mr. Kligman is to tell you that once you enter a negotiation with us, if you don't live up to your end of the bargain, you will vacation there. And you notice all those women and children in the baskets of fruit and this and that, that's to feed their sons, their uncles, their brothers, their husbands, and you have no one here, and you will starve to death. I had truly been intimidated, threatened many, many ways in my career, but never so originally. And so interestingly, uh, very, very interesting. It's just uh, incredible when you, you think back uh, that these things happen. You tell these stories to some people. Ah, uh, they say you just made it up. You're not really, yeah, didn't do that. You didn't do this. But they're true. They're absolutely true stories. There, there's another one, and I used her uh, for the heroine of my book uh, while I was in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Counterparts of mine. Uh, took me to a rather seedy part of Rio de Janeiro, and there it was pretty bad. Okay. Crime ridden, drugs, uh, everything. I met what was called an enforcer, and it was a woman. Strange and unusual. Most of them are 200 pound guys with so called muscles between their ears and whatever. Uh, I had an opportunity through the Brazilian I was with uh, to talk with her. She translated. And I found it very interesting. Uh, and I, as I said, I collect people like uh, circus collects animals, not knowing what I would do with them. But when I got the idea that I would write a story called Kill Alexis Markovic, 
instead of picturing this girl or this woman as an enforcer in Brazil, I transported her to a Russian who looks after the Russian criminal interests in the United States, more readable and uh, better scenario. But as I wrote this, I pictured her. I saw the softness, I saw the hardness. And again, as I say, women are very, very clever. And uh, this woman weaves a tale, does certain things in this book. Again, I will not spoil it for the potential reader. And uh, at the end of this book, I think someone would say, wow, I don't want to meet a woman like this, or wow, what are, I would like to meet somebody like this. And it's always been for me women. I, I have a, a special affinity for them, um, a high respect for them. As I mentioned, and it is a gospel truth, I've worked with women in the military, I've worked with, of course, women in the civilian sphere of them, and I would rather, given the choice, always be with one. And I married a very beautiful, dedicated, strong woman, and uh, it, the more I uh, interact or have, I find that uh, my, my understanding is absolutely correct. A lot of men won't agree with me. They will find... Uh, give you lots of reasons why what I've just said is not so. In my world, it is absolutely so. And I found, again, uh, just to go back to my military experience, uh, the fact that I was an intelligence officer, again, opened many, many doors. Every country, uh, almost every country I visited, and I was in and out of Vietnam many times, Cambodia. I also went to uh, uh, um, uh, Bang uh, not Bangladesh, but Laos, Vientiane, Laos, uh, on some occasion. And I've always visited the attaché's office. If I could do something for him at that particular point, I would. If not, the connection was made, maybe later on. Um, every time I was able to do something in a positive way, especially uh, when I roamed Saigon, I interacted with a lot of French companies there because the business was legitimate. And... Uh, Certain things that I asked them about, uh, they were able to tell me and uh, in some cases meet several people. Uh, I was able to report back certain things to the attaché's office. In Saigon at that particular time was a hotbed of intelligence. There was a lot of Eastern Bloc intelligence agencies running around there. Uh, we had many also uh, doing their thing. It was a dangerous place. In many cases, they would blow up the movie theater. Um, Many of the restaurants uh, along the famous street called Tudo Street eventually had chicken wire over the windows. So those cowboys, as we called them, that would ride the motorcycles, one driving, one on the back seat, they would throw the hand grenades into the various restaurants or establishments, kill whoever. It was extremely dangerous. Uh, a lot of um, soldiers uh, would take R&R &R there. They would come off the front lines. Uh, it was uh, a hotbed of uh, activity. I remember on one occasion um, when I finally returned home, uh, my dad asked me, what was it like in, in Vietnam when you were in and out of there? And I said, Dad, I can only tell you one story uh, that may encapsulate the entire experience called Vietnam. And... Uh, I told him uh, one of my associates, counterparts at the military attaché's office, invited me to a rooftop garden of a billet which probably housed a lot of Western embassy type personnel. On the top of the uh, building was this garden, a roof garden strung with Chinese lanterns in uh, many tables with tablecloths, silverware, dishes, very elegant. In one corner of the Roof was a uh, an American bluegrass band. Uh, my counterpart and I sat down at this table. He says, let me order. He says, we're ordering steak. You eat steak, don't you, Harris? I said, yeah, sure, of course I eat it. Won't, won't eat me first? Yeah. Um, he says, it comes from Japan. It's imported. I like that made a difference. Anyway, we ordered the steak. There were a number of military people in uniform, uh, M16 rifles around, uh, a lot of civilian ladies. Um, as we were eating, the bluegrass band started to play. About a mile or so later were our helicopter gunships shooting bullets and missiles into the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army. And we got tired of looking at the war. 
you would go back to your stake and then you'd pick your head up and look at the band. A few of the ladies and some of the men were dancing. And it was so surreal that here we are eating steak, dancing, listening to a, a bluegrass band. A couple of miles out, you're watching the helicopter gunships shoot a lot of tracers into the Kong, Viet Cong. And uh, then you're going back to your steak and eating. It, I said, that, it, that encapsulated the war. The more I went there, I saw the decay of, of Saigon. Um, my last trip in there was probably um, the late part of 74, maybe the early part of 75, just before we evacuated there. And as I would walk down the streets, I would see the garbage. I would smell the, forgive me, urine. Uh, I would see the absolute decay that was taking place. There was hopelessness of uh, the people that I would view. There were one, I remember one boy who had, it's hard to believe, a rat tied to a string, shoeshine boy. And as a, an American Westerner would walk the street, he would walk up to it, offer to shine their shoes, just said no. He dangled the rat in front of him and let the rat scurry either toward, back, around, and uh, I figured, uh, what the heck, uh, take out a, a few piastres, which was a local currency, just give it to them and uh, feel sorry for them that uh, my son isn't a duplicate of what I'm looking at. It was uh, the police, as we used to call them, the gray mouse, because of the uniform, they would shake down any foreigner they could see. Um, it was absolute, complete decay. I remember... Uh, being with a counterpart in uh, one of the clubs in Vietnam, in Saigon, and I had to go to the men's room. I walked in there, and I have never seen anything, never since or before. Forgive me again, urine on the floor, complete toilet uh, tissue all over the place. And there was a soldier in uh, fatigues, standing near one of the stalls. And I'm kind of wary about these things and I didn't want him to go near the urinal. And I kept looking at him and finally said, what do you need? I knew exactly what he was talking about. Uh, do I need heroin? Do I need what they used to call a speedball, which was popular, where they would take a cigarette uh, of marijuana and dip it in liquid heroin and let it dry, and boy, would you fly, as I understand from uh, smoking that. And I looked at this, this this soldier, an American soldier. I'm in civilian clothes. I didn't identify myself as a officer or anything like that. And I thought, holy cow, with everything else that I've just seen, the decay, the hopelessness, the smells, the garbage, and I'm walking into a club and I see an American soldier who wants to sell me dope. And as it progressed, there were uh, there was a significant problem in Vietnam, which most people either don't realize or don't know. But uh, there were the in the quartermaster corps. There's a group called the uh, Graves Registration, and they would send home, unfortunately, our servicemen, soldiers, Marines, whatever in body bags. In many cases, the ones who rotated back to the states and uh, took up a position stateside at grave registration, and the ones that remained had a code where they would put in, not always, but in many cases, I know this for a fact that I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating, would put whatever narcotics uh, into the grave, into the body bag, mark the tag in such a way that at the other end, they would know this was a bag that contained it. And until it uh, was halted, uh, this, is, this is what our, some of our soldiers, some engaged in, unfortunately. Many of the soldiers that came back, many of the Marines did have drug problems. That is a fact. Did they receive the kind of treatment they should have? Questionable. 
Uh, I don't know the answer. From what I do understand, the answer is no, but I don't know the actual answer. I can just assume it. But I saw Vietnam at uh, in Saigon at a peak after the French lost the war in Dien Bien Phu in 1964. It was a pristine country with wide boulevards, palm trees, beautiful, beautiful place. I saw it just before it fell in 1975. And if there is a classification for a hellhole, that surely was it. Um, unfortunately, when the Vietnam veteran came home, the American public blamed him or her for the war instead of the people and officials that sent them there. It was a bad war, but the people that served, the soldiers, the Marines, sailors, airmen, whatever, served with dignity, and passion, and they did their job as, as the job entailed. It's not their fault for Vietnam, but it is was amazing for me to see it at its pristine high and then witness the complete destruction to the point where it's no more Saigon, it's Ho Chi Minh City, and uh, completely communist. Um, I had some interesting times. I witnessed the change of governments in Indonesia, where uh, Sukarno was the dictator, military dictatorship. It was overthrown by a man named Suharto, another military man. Um, his wife was named Ten Suharto, and the Ten st standard stood for the percentage that to do business there was required to pay to her charity. Oh. It was always that, as we call it in Spanish, the morbida, the bite, part of doing business in that part of the world. Unfortunately, it is a fact. It was necessary. Uh, I remember in one instance, company I worked for was a very large company in New York, International, had offices throughout the world. Uh, the way we operated is that when we went into a country, for instance, uh, in Bolivia, they had tin. We as a company didn't want a portion of that. We wanted the entire output of the country. We had a uh, situation where the present military or grouping that was in control in Bolivia uh, didn't feel comfortable with working with us the way we wanted it. So my organization decided to back an opposition party for president, et cetera. We lost. And that uh, particular group did not succeed. Our manager calls up New York and says, I got to get out of here. They're going to put me in jail, obviously. Uh, what we did was we took them out of La Paz, Bolivia, in the trunk of a car. We took them over the Andes Mountains into Chile, flew them from Chile to Mexico City, where he became our manager, and he's still alive today. Uh, these were the kind of things that happened. I was in Saudi Arabia on one occasion. Um, our manager there said, Harris, uh, we were walking in the streets of Riyadh. says, Harris, uh, I have a problem. My wife uh, mentioned a name and daughters. We have to we have to leave here. He said, oh, when I get back, Harry, to New York, we'll, we'll get something working. He says, don't fail me, please. We did get him out. He's now about 95 years old, lives in Texas. And uh, this was the part of the adventure I had. Um, if it wasn't fun and games in the military, so to speak, it was in the civilian life, but it was never, ever boring. So fast forward to my second career. I retired from the Army as a reserve uh, major in uh, 1979. Uh, I wanted to stay longer. I was educationally promotable to lieutenant colonel, but Nancy said to me, you got 20, please. Uh, you're away between the civilian job and this, and based on what I've told you regarding what she had to do to bring up the boys and, and keep the household going, and uh, I said, yeah, Nancy, I didn't want to. I truly didn't want to. I enjoyed what I did. I figured I was positive in what I did, contributed as much as I could to my beliefs that 
Um, my country deserved anything and everything I could do for him. But I acquiesced and I said, yes, Nancy, it's over. Retirement is not fun unless there is something you can do. And Rob came to me and said to me during COVID, he said, Dad, you wrote some children's stories and you wrote a couple of books. He said to me, uh, before that, let me preface first of all, he said, Dad, would you mind writing a page or a page and a half? Tell me what you did, where you did it, with whom you did it. And I said, sure, Rob, sure. So I went down to what I call the downstand, downstairs dungeon, a rickety table with an old computer that wouldn't take a Microsoft update. And I started to write this story, this what I did. And from two and a half or so pages I envisioned, turned into a 370 page novel called Bad Boy, which I've not yet published. From that point on, I started to write a few books. Then fast forward to COVID, Rob said, hey, all this negative news, all this terrible stuff that's going on, Dad, maybe we ought to publish one of your books and bring you know, some people, uh, some adventures that you've experienced in your fictional writing. And I thought, sure, not a bad idea, but I haven't a clue how to do it. So don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. From that, we now uh, have published 10 books one of which I, I did, I brought a couple, one of which uh, I wrote about Vietnam, which is called Requiem for a Soldier. Doing quite well. Um, I took a uh, Spanish guy, I speak Spanish, I like the Spanish people. Um, I took a Spanish individual who was a member of the Latin King street gang. He realized that uh, continuing in this venue, is uh, going to either wind up in jail or get uh, killed. He enlists in the military, gets sent to Vietnam, and that's his story. Um, the other one um, was a uh, individual that I had met, um, an Afghan veteran, a matter of fact, during my travels. An interesting character, pretty savvy, uh, well-educated. And I thought I'd take him, since he has a interesting background, and uh, make him the number two man of a drug lord in New York. Then taking people that have no idea of what the world of drugs is really about, how it's manufactured in Mexico, how it's distributed in the United States, the detriment it has on the populace, and uh, weave a good story. And uh, I weave one where he gets involved in a love situation with a drug lord's woman. And uh, there we go from that point on. There always will be women, strong and unique. And uh, they are always uh, in my uh, stories. The uh, one that comes to mind, my uh, wife's favorite book, is one called Her Father's Daughter, where uh, a young woman with a background in art and an attorney uh, gets hired by a firm that is trying to recover lost art during World War II. Then she discovers a secret, which changes her life forever. Won't ruin it for anybody that might want to read it. Uh, then I, my other one other that I really like is called The Profession, which I have a concert pianist, gets recruited by an organization that deals in assassinations. She's She's paired with an Englishman by the name of Robert Mundy, and they go on their merry way to assassinate a Chinese uh, individual uh, who is detrimental to the West. Um, so women always are in my stories, whether it's Kill Alexis Markovic, whether it's The Profession, whether it's her father's daughter, all in all, as I, I said at the outset, I truly have a, a, an admir a moderation for a woman. In fact, when I come back, I've already decided I'll be a six foot, two inch blue eyed blonde. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so forth and so on. Uh, my wife says, no, you are not coming back like that. Uh, but I, I enjoy writing and bringing women into this thing because uh, it gives a new dimension to a male reader. Mm. He thinks that, uh, okay, uh, let's call it an assassin. It's got to be a man. He's got to be uh, muscle-bound, all this. Uh, not at all. 
the most uh, innocent looking person is the one that usually is able to yeah. infiltrate mm -hmm. and uh, do what her assignment or his assignment says. So usually a woman, it's usually a woman. Um, so I've enjoyed writing this. Um, Rob has been pretty good with the blog site, which is harrislkligman.com. It's got all the books that we've written. Um, I continue to write, by the way. It's not just uh, publishing a back catalog. Um, the book, uh, The World of Nicholas Lord, surprisingly, only took me about three months to complete. I have a system with this completely unorthodox. If I took a writing course in college and told uh, the professor how I do it, he would flunk me in the course. I'd get an F. But what I do is I think of a title. I picture some of the people based on my past, women, men, whatever. Uh, I come down to the computer and I start writing. I leave off after maybe an hour, an hour and a half. Um, I have no outline. I have no plot. I have no idea where I'm going. I finish for the day. The next day I come back. I read a couple of lines that I uh, ended with. I pick it up and I start to write. I'm now in the process of writing my uh, 11th novel. Um, in fact, the 11th novel uh, will be published. I'm sorry. An 11th novel we've now completed and proofing called Life on the Dark Side. Uh, one of the things this writing of mine has brought is a bonding, very close bonding between Rob, uh, Nancy Ann, and myself, where we proof the books together. We have some criticism. Um, I'm not the best typist in the world, so I'm going to put a wrong letter here or a misspelled name there. Uh, they're smart people. <laughs> they figure it out. They tell me. And we have fun as we go through this book. So the um, 11th book will be out probably this fall, Life on the Dark Side. Um, and uh, working on the the twelfth book now, and we'll see uh, we'll see how uh, how it works out. And I'm having fun because it keeps me busy, and uh, the gray matter upstairs doesn't get stale; it keeps getting stimulated. So we have a lot of fun, and uh, that's basically it. I, I just want to summarize and say that uh, uh, I had strong parents. Um, my dad was. A very interesting character, if I may. Um, he lost his father at 16 years old, became more or less the head of the household with a uh, two siblings, a sister, younger sister, and a brother. And in order to allow the family to survive, he started to drive a taxi in Philadelphia. He found out that uh, in those days that you could take a test. And if you pass this test, it was equivalent to four years of college. He, during his taxi idle time, would study, he knew what he had to study, and what would be on the test. He told me uh, that he had memorized something called Caesar's Gallic Wars, where all he had to do was see the beginning of the paragraph, and he could translate it into Latin or into English. Anyway, he took this test, passed it, and he applied for law school and got accepted at Dickinson Law School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And I looked at him and he says, oh, I know what you're going to say. Where did I get money to go to school? He said, don't forget Harris and Dickinson in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Dickinson. They have taxis. And he says, what I did was I lived in what is termed a flop house. I collected cardboard and old newspapers, which I used uh, for my betting. And he said in 19, uh, five years later, or three years later out of law school, he graduated, he took the Philadelphia bar and became a lawyer. The reason I'm telling this story, on the other hand, oh, well, I'll just let me stay with that. Uh, the reason I'm telling this story is that my father never used the word can. And he said, I don't want you to use it. And I thought about it. He says, if you have to reflect, think of me sometime, son, and what I did driving that taxi, studying for that test, going to law school where there were 
students from privileged families that had money, joining fraternities, all this and that. I'm driving a taxi, sleeping in a flop house. He says, I never regretted it. It made me a stronger person. He says, I hope you'll remember the story I told you. Never use the word can. And I have never used that word. I do not use that word. All things are possible. All things. I found that if I stay calm, hear me, Dad? If I stay calm, <laughs> I can solve almost anything. And I found that uh, in this life, I've learned that one act of kindness can change a person's life forever. So in addition to my writing, which I thoroughly enjoy creating something out of nothing, I volunteered for what is called the Friendship Circle in my area, which works with physically and challenge both children and adults. I, in all honesty, never realized how many there were. I never knew that. Obviously, I'm not stupid. I understand these things do happen, and there are occasionally when you see one, two, three, or four of these. When you see a gathering of them, 20, 25, 30, your heart goes out to them. Uh, I look at the parents, and I think, wow, what love and devotion it must be that you do this. Obviously, it's our child. But the amount of effort and the amount of care and, and kindness and understanding it's just amazing to me. So that's an uplifting thing for me. Um, I find that uh, I am uplifted when I'm a part of this organization. We're off for the summer. We will gather again in the fall. As I said, uh, I want to give of myself. I do want to give back. I've achieved success in almost everything I've undertaken. Uh, my military career has been a good one, as I said. I've graduated uh, the uh, resident non-registered instruction at Fort, uh, Fort uh, Leavenworth, Kansas, Command and General Co Staff College. Not everybody does it. I'm a graduate of the National Security University in Washington, D.C. I hold a master's degree uh, from Temple University. I speak a number of languages. Um, I have made friends all over the world. My sons, uh, during their uh, youth, uh, saw a number of people enter our house, have dinner with us. Um, one of our my good friends, who's now passed, a general in the Indian Army by the name of Jacobs, was a frequent visitor of my house, brought uh, gifts to my sons. But what they did see is people from other cultures who were sophisticated and learned as anything they can identify with, let's say, a fellow American. They learn to understand them that although people may be different as far as their appearance, it's immaterial. It's what's inside. It's the way they act. It's their image. It's their character. They grew up with this, and I cannot tell you how many friends and associates and uh, that they have in all walks of life. And I feel, I feel proud that we were able to do this. And Nancy, um, with comfortable to a degree with it. Um, during uh, the uh, Cold War, when uh, Germany uh, neutralized and became a little bit warmer, there were some Germans that came to the house. Nancy wasn't too comfortable with that. But being the trooper that she is, she felt it was important for her husband and his business. And she acquiesced. and. Uh, she was always available. I said, Nancy, I need you as my partner. We have to go into New York. We're going to visit with this, that. Uh, we had fun. We ate at good restaurants. We had fun. We listened to music. We were at clubs. But it was a chore because you can't pick the people that you are with. Would she want to be with these people? Of course not. There was nothing in common, especially when I'm speaking a language to them she doesn't understand. And every once in a while, I would turn to her and say, they, she would hear the laughter and she kind of, and I would explain or somebody else would explain what it was. But she never, ever felt that um, anything I did was beyond what she could help. And... Uh, that's where we are today, 55 years later in October. 
Uh, most women, as I say, would have thrown a towel in. They absolutely would. They would not have put up in it. Uh, they would not. Um, they, they wouldn't. They couldn't. They couldn't because of either the physical or mental capacity that they have, or the fact that they didn't have enough love and wanted to work. They would have cut and run. Anyway, that I bored you a little bit. But any questions you have, please. Feel free to ask. <laughs> I threw the kitchen sink at you. <laughs> well, just I, I, out of curiosity, like what is your favorite place to visit? You've been to so many places. You've had so many things. What If, if you could go back to one of them, what would it be? Uh, that's interesting. I think, and I took Nancy there on numerous occasions, was Korea. Mm -hmm. I think because I have so many fond memories of that, I actually was in place for four and a half years. As I say, I immersed myself in the culture, the language. Uh, during that time, I decided to uh, train in one of their martial arts, which was called Hapkido. Uh, at the end of four years, I was awarded a black belt. They didn't give it to me because I was an American and say, well, you train for a month and then we'll give you a black belt. No, you have to earn it just like the others do. I uh, took me a long time. I did get hurt, I had a dislocated shoulder, a few broken bones, these things happen. But because that I, I did this, they gained a respect for me. Um, and it was taught in Korean, of course, you either, you know, no English was spoken, I didn't speak English, learned the language. Um, I had one experience, uh, and I'll tell you a story, where uh, while I was there in business, we went to visit a government official, which um, certain monies were exchanged by the Korean I was with who worked for me. And as we're sitting there um, on the floor, low table on a rug, um, Mr. Shin would always interpret what this Korean official would say, never indicating or letting it be known that I spoke the language or understood it. Anyway, they got into somewhat of a discussion and the gentleman, using a stretch of that word, uh, said to him, why do you, meaning as a Korean, lick the soles of the shoes of this American dog? Uh, Mr. Shin did not flinch, did not look my way, did not change his facial expression, knew I understood exactly what was said, and went back with something that kind of uh, let the situation dissolve. And uh, after we're finished with this and we're thanking and bowing and all that crazy stuff, we walk out and Shin says, look, I'm sorry about that. I said, you don't have to be. Nothing's wrong with that. It's just the way he felt. He expressed it to you. Maybe American, whether it's me or somebody else, can change his opinion in some time to come. But he took it upon himself, because we were friends, to feel the hurt that he filled, figured I felt. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, uh, so I did bond, and we had some good relations with a lot of them. Um, his house, which is unusual to invite an American, I, I many times, uh, I helped his uh, one of his children come over here and go to school. Anything I could do to repay it. But uh, I felt that I want to understand them. I want to present a different image of the Americans they saw. Remember in that particular period of time, there were approximately 50,000 American military from Pusan, uh, the Navy, all the way up to the uh, Panmunjom border, uh, 38th parallel, uh, a lot of soldiers um, doing some things that were not very good. You can imagine uh, you get drunk in Seoul and things happen with ladies and whatever. Anyway, the image was not always good of Americans and uh, in many cases, Koreans detest them. I like to think I was the guy that was different. I was the one that presented the image that uh, I'll do anything I can to help you. Uh, we work as, as comrades. I'm not your boss. I'm your fellow compatriot in the sense that we work for the same company, get paid by the same organization. We're after the same goals. 
and we achieved a number of things together. Where just before I left, believe it or not, the organization I was with sold to the Pub Republic of Korea from Louisiana the largest amount of rice in the history of that country. Can you imagine? Here's a rice economy that needed rice. We were the ones that sold it. The man that I was with about the soles of the shoes was one of the instrumental people of doing that. We also built there with a German counterpart, a tobacco company that processed their tobacco into cigarettes, et cetera, et cetera. We achieved some absolute successes. And I want to think that it was in part due to the relationship I had with the employers that worked for it. Yes, they had to follow my orders, just like a sergeant has to follow a lieutenant's orders. But they, I wanted them to do with respect and confidence, always lead with the right way, not do it because I can order you to do it. And that's the way I've always adopted everything I've done with my work environment and my military. Uh, I wanted to lead by example. That example should be the best I could ever be. Uh, I studied hard. I went to a number of military schools. Uh, I graduated infantry officers basic school. I went to airborne ranger school uh, in the intelligence field. I did the intelligence basic course. I did the advanced course. I was at uh, Fort Holabird in Maryland in those days. As I mentioned, I uh, did the, the Command and General Staff College thing um, in the Security University. Um, I wanted to be the best I could be. There was nothing wrong in that. I feel that I've instilled that in my, my children. Rob is an absolute success in his field. My other son is a, an attorney out of Las Vegas. Um, we are a happy family together. Um, I am living a great life. People say, well, I've lived a great life. Well, you're still living. Well, of course you're living a great life. I have lived and continue to live a magnificent life. I've been fortunate to be in so many countries, Brazil, Argentina, Angola, South Africa, from Johannesburg to, to Nairobi, to, to Kenya, to uh, Suriname, to on and on and on and on. And it has just been a magical world for me. And through all of that, as I mentioned, yours truly has become an author. And my children's books and my novels are now published, which are on Amazon, etc. And uh, I can bring a world to a reader. The most interesting and satisfying thing that can happen for me as an author is when someone tells me that I reached the last page and I thought time well spent and I'm sorry there's not another chapter. Wow, holy cow, wow. Did I do that, me? And, and you just have to pinch yourself and you say, where did the words come from? But it happened. It is a fact. I continue to enjoy it. I don't think I'll stop. Uh, we're going to work on our fourth children's book at some point. As I mentioned, the 11th book, uh, uh, Life on the Dark Side, is going to come out in the fall. And uh, we're going to have some fun. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> well, you you mentioned that uh, you work people you know into characters in your book. Um, your father was such an important influence in your life. Did you make did you make a character out of your father? That's a good question. No, but his that's very very. I hadn't thought about that. Um, I hadn't thought about that. It's very interesting. No. But I reflect to him all the time. I'm a funny guy, and you're going to think I'm crazy. I talk to him a lot, as I do my mother. Uh, that might seem strange in certain circles, uh, but I believe that that they can hear wherever they are. They're looking down, and when I, or they're standing somewhere near me. And I must tell you, in all honesty, when I think that I want to do something, I question to myself. Would mom or dad say this was the right thing to do? Do you want to think it through a little bit more, Kligman, or do you want to 
rush into it and would mom and dad appreciate. Many times they've saved me from going off the deep end, taking the shortcut that might result in a, in a problem. I often thank them. I only wish that many, many children do not realize they take their parents for granted. They don't realize how wonderful and kind and most of them they are until unfortunately they're gone. I often think, uh, even though as I talk to my parents, I would give anything to touch you again, to hold your hand, to put your hand against my cheek, to look in your eyes and thank you for all you did for me, the sacrifices you made. Uh, I never, I, I, as I say, I never will forget them. Uh, they died at an early age. They got married, uh, unfortunately, at a late age. My dad was around six, 36 when uh, he got married. Uh, my mom also was first generation. Her, her parents were here, uh, immigrants. Um, they came and settled in Atlantic City, New Jersey. I often, uh, mom was uh, mom was sick when I was growing up uh, in those days. Um, well, I don't know, a doctor didn't do quite a good job when I was born, unfortunately caused some ongoing problems. I remember many, many times my dad taking me to the hospital in Philadelphia, standing outside, pointing up a young kid and saying, mom's in that room up there. How could I ever see? It was a building of maybe 12 stories with a million windows. But I looked up and uh, um, I was in Atlantic City many times. My grandmother raised me for a while until my mom could come home in a way. And I always thought to myself, too, that this is a sacrifice she made for me. She didn't ask to be physically impaired, but it happened. And she still loved me, found time to cook and do all the motherly things. And I owed her so much. I remember as I used to come home from grade school in those days, we could walk for lunch and we would come home and eat. I always saw my mom looking out of the kitchen window in this small half a house, uh, looking out the window, watching me enter the driveway. And then she would go back and prepare the sandwich, but always looking to see me safely return. And I didn't realize a lot, I realized a good deal until I became a parent myself. And then I saw some similarities and I tried to transpose what my mom taught me, be understanding, be willing to listen, give advice when it's asked for, give the best advice you can, uh, don't lie, um, don't do things that project a, no, a negative in, image have manners. They watched as I pulled the chair out for Nancy so she could sit down. I held the door open when we got into the car. Respectful, because that's what you have to be to another human being. Um, I never forgot the lessons I was taught with a strong father, a loving mother. She had no formal education, but she loved me. She taught me right from wrong. She said, when someone does something for you, write a note back. You say, thank you. When somebody says, thank you to you, you say, you're welcome. It doesn't cost you anything to be a decent, nice human being. And it's right. And I said the same thing to my children. You don't take one penny out of your pocket to be a nice human being. Yeah. And uh, that's what I've tried to do. I was fortunate in many respects, although I didn't like it at the time to be an only child, but I uh, learned a lot because of it. Of course, my parents were there and I was the only one. They had no other person to teach, but me, I had it 100%. Anyway, so next question, I'll be glad to answer. Uh, those were all the questions I had for you. So uh, if you have any other final words of wisdom or anything you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, I'd like to quote somebody. Uh, I have a tremendous respect for a South African politician and social activist whose name is Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. I never met the gentleman, 
Uh, I wish I had the opportunity to, to do that. He is a very intelligent, brilliant, astute person. He once said something I never forgot. Nine words. He said, I never lose. I either win or I learn. Mm. If someone will just stop for a moment and think about those words, I never lose, kind of, you know, haughty, but got to listen to the rest of it. I either win or I learn. I have adopted that as my one of my character traits. There's no disgrace to fail and try. The mm -hmm. only disgrace is to not try. You can fail. You learn by failures. You learn not to make the same mistake again. That's what he was trying to convey. But people don't necessarily do that. The easy way, hey, I did it before, big deal. So, okay, I'll do it again. No, no. I thought he was so, so astute. A lot of people have said a lot of things, but those words just made such an impact on me. And I made sure that my sons realized that too. You either win or you learn. Boy, I tell you, so powerful from a man who has unfortunately passed. I think of all the wisdom a set that he could impart today, but I uh, I never forgot those words as part of my character. So if I can leave your you, Man. your kind audience, and I want to thank you so much. You're such a nice lady. I don't get to tell this these stories often. There'll be some of your audience will say, oh, like his books, he embellished a little bit, uh, or maybe a lot. No, I don't do that. I don't have to. Um, my wife lived it. My sons lived it. They weren't necessarily in the countries I were in. Nancy, yes. As I say, I've taken her to Korea. We've gone to Europe. Uh, we've been to Hong Kong together, to Japan. Yes, we've seen the world together. Um, so she is a testimony to the many people I know, the adventures that we've had. Um, some of them, I didn't tell you one of her stories that uh, uh, maybe I should I divert or should I not divert? Or should oh, I? Go ahead. Go uh, ahead. Go uh, ahead. No, why not? Um, Sometimes you are experiencing something that is absolute shocking because you can't believe, even as it's happening or after it's happening, that it actually did happen. Nancy and I uh, are, were with the wife and I believe one or two of the daughters of the individual that we took out of Saudi Arabia, <laughs> as I mentioned. We're in, I believe it was... Um, Germany. I believe it was there. I'm not quite sure. And we were in the restaurant, the hotel restaurant where they were staying. He was away on a business and we were kind of talking generalities until he would come in and we would all have lunch together. We were seated at a table that was right next to a bar, long bar <clears throat> with many tables. And as I'm, I'm quiet, not uh, really uh, doing much. I was the only guy there with all these lovely ladies. And they were talking and some of the things they were talking about uh, were personal women things and uh, you know, whatever. The next thing we know is a man sitting on one of the stool, turns in in English and says to us, um, I happen to be attending a uh, convention, a medical convention, I'm a gynecologist. Um, I've overheard some of the things you were talking about. May I join you? And uh, I don't know whether it's Lillian or my wife, Nancy, had said, yeah, okay, kind of like, you, how can you say no or whatever? Anyway, we had ordered some uh, appetizers to be served while waiting for uh, the lady's husband. And he sat down and uh, the girls uh, started asking him some questions and what was coming back uh, wasn't what it should be. It, we was not a doctor, didn't seem to be a doctor. 
uh, they were going back and forth, and uh, I'm not tuned in well. But I decided that I would pick up a small uh, salmon and cream cheese, little piece of bread, uh, and I would take a couple of bites of it. As I'm moving my hand with the food towards my mouth, the next thing I know, the doctor, so-called, grabs my wrist, moves my hand towards his mouth, and takes a bite out of the, <laughs> the item. Nancy, who knows me, said, you better get out of here right now. My husband is going to kill you. And Lillian says, yes, he will get on whatever. And I looked at him and I said in colloquial French, if you don't get the F out of here, I will tear you apart with my bare hands. And I said, now, and the chair went over as he stood up. And he walked back to his place a couple of steps and sat down back at the bar. And the girls and I are looking at each other. We're by this time, he's, uh, the husband isn't there. And Nancy says, I just lost my appetite. Lily and the other woman says, yeah, me too. Let's get out of here. This is terrible. Uh, where should we go? And Nancy says, I saw a Louis Vuitton store around the corner. Let's all go there and shop. So we went there. And then Nancy picked out a couple of things and she says, this is what I'd like, Harris. So I bought her a, a Louis Vuitton satchel and whatever else it was. The girls and uh, my friend's wife did what they did. We looked at each other and said, what do we do? And said, we all need a drink. So we went to one of the outdoor cafes close to the hotel so we could see if uh, the husband was coming, ordered some drinks, sat there eventually. He came, we told him what happened. He went into the bar looking for the scotch and said, Harry, don't, don't do this, please. He said, no, 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 no. My wife was insulted too and blah, blah, blah. He was gone. So this is a story we tell. And yeah. if you, you mention this to somebody, they think, wow, what an imagination this guy has. You know, this story, taking it to his mouth. I never in my life ever, ever confronted a situation like this. Wow. And the women were were beside themselves. As it as I mentioned, as they talked, uh, I said to Nancy afterwards, I said, you look like you were agitated before the incident happened, but what were you guys? She said, he was in the doctor. The things we were asking him wasn't coming back the way it... But yeah. Yeah, you you would know yeah. more yeah. than I know about that stuff. But it's just... But this is the, the lunatics you meet along the way in some cases. It's funny now to tell that story. And Nancy cringes every time she thinks about it. And then we laugh a little bit. Uh, but these are these are some of the situations that we've wow. had. It is just wild, the people wow. that you meet. Yeah. Uh, we were in Berlin in one case. We went to, uh, well, it was Munich, really. Uh, we went to the beer hall where uh, Hitler had his push. Oh. I... Uh, Nancy was an extremely uncomfortable. She says, I got to get out of here. And of course we did. And so, you know, yeah, I, I'm looking now. Rob just walked in anyway. Uh, so, you know, ventures, plenty of plenty of ventures. So I had this multitude of material to draw on. So, Stories and whatever. There's never a dull cocktail party. I'm no. sure. <laughs> so, so explain to me again what this picture is. This is uh, taken at jump school, airborne school at Fort Benning, Georgia in 1959. Wow. Shortly thereafter, became a paratrooper. <laughs> Excellent.